thank you, Jesus. Lord, we once again thank you, Father, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness over our lives. Even through the past one week, Father God, I thank you, Lord, for you being our refuge, our fortress and our strength, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, for the ways in which you have led us and brought us this far, Father. And even this evening, as we meditate on your word, I pray, Father God, that our hearts will be receptive ground. And I pray, Father, that every word that is being spoken from your word, Father God, will fall on the good ground of our hearts, produce a hundredfold return, Lord. And Daddy, we pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit will move in this place. And I pray, Father God, that you will do what only you can do, Father God. Daddy, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are you glad that you are in God's house this evening? Are you? Can we, uh, before we get into the word, can we spend a little time speaking in tongues to the Lord so that we will have a, a focus and, a, and an anointing that flows in this place. Amen. Can we all stand up to our feet? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Riba laba raba shandara riba la bara shiraba kaburo liberi shandare riba la bara shandara riba la bara shandara riba la kaburo liberi shiraba rime kabara la bara shandare rima na ra shiraba kaburo liberi kabara la bara ba rishandara riba la kaburo shimbere ribiri kabara shiraba rime kaburo liberi shandara riba la laburo shiraba that even right now, Father God, let Your Holy Spirit move in this place, Father God. Daddy, let your anointing flow in this place, Father God. Every plan, every scheme, every ploy of the devil, I bind and break it right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Father God, that your word will come forth with power and with might, Father God. And I pray, Lord, that we will have an exciting time this evening, Father God, in your word. And I pray, Father, that every word that comes out of my mouth, Father God, Daddy, let it be according to your plan and according to your purpose, Father God. Daddy, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Is the video ready? Okay, I mean, while they are preparing the video on, I just want to uh, break this evening into a lighter mode before we get into the word. I mean, let me tell you a joke. This joke is something which kind of came up yesterday while we were uh, sitting down in a, in a house as we were having lunch. Suddenly somebody came up with something and I suddenly remembered about this joke and I was just about to say No, no, don't say the joke. That's for tomorrow You know, so let me just bring that joke out uh, There was this lady, you know, this lady was uh, about 60 years old and uh, She was suddenly taken to the hospital because she had a heart attack now while in the bed while she was being operated on uh, she had an encounter with the Lord. She had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. And she asked Jesus, is this my end? And then the Lord said, not really. I think I can give you a 40 years extension to your life. And this lady was glad that she can come back and she can do all that she wanted to do. And immediately after the operation was done and she came out, from the ICU, she called for other doctors who are plastic surgeons. Now she is 60 years old, you, you can imagine. And uh, she called all the plastic surgeons and said, you need to make me as though I look 30. Now, then the doctors went to work on it, work on her. They did the liposuction, they, lit the, uh, they did all the uh, tummy trimming, they did all the facelift that you can ask for. And by the time she got out from there, she looked as if she was 30 years old. Now, this took about two months time. And then she was on the road. Uh, she left the hospital and as she was walking down the road, suddenly a car comes and hits her. The car comes and hits her and she instantly dies. And now when she is dead, she comes before God. And she is standing before the Lord and she asks, Lord, what happened here? I thought I was supposed to live for another 40 years. And the Lord said, Oh, is that you? I didn't even recognize it was you. You know? 
So, as you, as you uh, kind of, oh, it's, it's, it's only Tina who like those, you know? <laughs> All right, if I can have the lights off and if we can play this video. That video kind of tells us that we are all in a race. Amen? We are running and we are running towards a goal that is in front of us. Now, I just need to say this to you that this message that, uh, that I would like to share with you this evening is, is very important. It's an important message. It's an important message because after the message of salvation, after you have received Christ into your life, God has a plan and a purpose for you. And this is to lay that foundation, to lay that understanding of you as to who you are in Christ and why you are here and things like that. So I want you to grab this word with your spirit man. man. It's important, so you need to grab it with your spirit man, not with your uh, physical senses or with your... Uh, uh, just your understanding, but with your spirit man. Amen? So make sure that your spirit man is alive. Is your spirit man alive and live and kicking this evening? Amen. All right. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you here are in the age group of uh, up to 18? Uh, I see Kiran's hand going like this. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sister Rani is 18. Okay. Now, if you are under 18, 18 and below, this, no, physically, in this material world, this message is very important for you. Okay. So, someone who is between 18 and 35, can I see your hands? Oh, really? <laughs> All right. There are some people who are lifting their hands anyway. So, if you are under 35, this, in, this message is very, very important for you. Okay? Anybody above 35? Yeah? There are a few hands which went up. This message is very, very, very important for you. Okay? Now, what I'm trying to say is, the message is very important. And it is with perspective 
to understanding the kingdom of God. And as you understand the kingdom of God, we need to understand that God has a plan, God has a purpose, and He has a destiny for each one of us. So, uh, if you think of it, there was a day in your life that you chose Jesus. And that day maybe you sang the song like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. Is that what you sang? Is that what you really had resolved in your mind? If you didn't, this is the evening to do it. Okay? This evening we need to make a resolution and a resolve that you're going to follow Jesus all the days of your life. And as a Christian, it is very important for you to understand how the kingdom works. It's very important for you to understand the principles of the kingdom of God. Why do you say that? Because if you think of it, uh, turn with me to John chapter 17 and verse 14. This is what Jesus said. If Jesus said it, is it important? It's very, very, very important, right? Yeah, Sister Ani only agreeing with me. What about the rest of you? If Jesus said it, is it important? Okay, this is what Jesus said. I don't know whether you understand this fully, but this evening, let's kind of comprehend this with our spirit man. He said, I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. What did Jesus say? He is not of this world. And then he also says, you are not of this world. Right? Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are not of this world? If you believe that you are not of this world, then you are an alien here, right? Yeah, that's what it says. I mean, if you go to the US immigration, they'll call for people who are citizens. They'll call for people who are on immigration. And then they will call for people who are aliens. Right? Why is it that they call them aliens? Because they don't belong to that land. Right? So, if you think of it, you are in Abu Dhabi, right? Do you belong to Abu Dhabi? Not really. You don't belong to Abu Dhabi. You belong to a country where you came from. Now, you are in this town, but you are not of this town. And that's what Jesus said. You are in the world, but you are not of this world. You are of a kingdom which belongs to Jesus. The day you sang and the day you decided, I have decided Jesus. That's right. Because you decided to follow Jesus, Jesus said, I am not of this world. And then if you follow Jesus, then you are not of this world. Amen? So when we saw that, uh, you know, that video that we saw, you saw a man who is running. Right? It's the same, same thing for each one of us. We are all in a race. Now, if you think of that race, that man was running on his own. Right? There's no one with him. Now, if you think of the Christian race, it is a race where you run on your own. You have a plan, you have a purpose, you have a destiny. God has already decided that even before you're formed in your mother's womb. And that's what the Bible says, that each one of us are unique and God has a plan and God has a purpose. And as you run this race of life, of Christian life, you need to understand that there are many different things that come in your way, right? But you're not to be discouraged about it. You're not to be disheartened about it because God is with you. Amen? But one of the things that we need to see and understand is in the world, we have seen many races. We have seen in the Olympic Games, there are 100 meters race, there is marathon. And in all these, what we see is there must be at least 10 or 12 tracks. And in all those 12 tracks, there will be 12 people. And all these people are running towards one goal, one finish line. But because we see that, we think that we are all in that kind of a race, even in the Christian life. It is not. 
In the Christian life, you are running your track. And your track is so unique as much as you are. Amen? Out of the 7 billion people, you're just one person who's so unique. God has made you so unique that God has even got a plan and a purpose which is so unique for you. Amen? So in the Christian race, we have our own track and we have our own race to run. And one of the things that we understand uh, about this race is, if you think of Paul, if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, this is what Paul said. Paul said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Amen? So what, what do you understand by when Paul says, I have kind of fought the good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. If you think of it, he has come to the end of his life on earth, and he's looking back and thinking, or saying this aloud, that I have run this race well. I've run this race the way God wanted me to run. I've been a good steward of all that God has put into my hands. Amen? And I've come to a place when I look back, there is nothing as backlog that I have with Christ. I finished the course. When you come to the place where you have finished the course, that means you have already finished all that God had given you. Amen? So here is Paul so confidently saying that I've come to the end of my race. And I know I've kept my faith and I've done all that God has called me to do. This message is a very compelling message. It is a message which may challenge you. But I'm telling you that if you will do what God has called us to do as, as we hear the message out. If we will get to the place where we wrap this message around our spirit man. And get hold of this message, of this revelation. I'm telling you the life that you live will be like Paul. Amen. You'll be able to one day turn back and say, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, I've finished the course. Amen? So as Paul, we are in Christ. Same as Paul was. We also have a plan, we also have a purpose, and we have a destiny to get to. And with all that, it also comes uh, a significant part of our race, which is the accountability that we have with our Creator. Amen? So even if Paul was running this race, he always had this in mind that he's accountable to God in everything that he did. So there was an accountability that he had with God in such a way that everything that God had given him, whether it's the time, whether it's the resource, whether it's the opportunity, he used it well. Amen? So this evening, what we want to ponder on is this. This is the title of the message, okay? Call to be a steward with accountability to our Creator. Called to be a steward. Paul was a good steward. Paul was a good steward because he said, I have finished the course, I have done everything that God had called me to do. And now it is time for me to go and be with my Lord. Amen? So when you get to that place, Paul says in his accounts that you will hear from God, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? That's what we all want to hear, right? So this evening, let's look at what it means to be a steward. Or let's look at what is stewardship. It's very important. According to the kingdom of God, we need to understand what stewardship is. We need to understand who a steward or a good steward is in the kingdom of God. It's not like the steward which we talk about in the worldly sense. It's about the kingdom of God version of the stewardship that we're talking about. Okay, now I need to kind of illustrate something. So here is what we're going to do. You need to reach out to your back and pull out your wallet. Okay, you have a wallet? No wallets? Come on. The ladies would have purse, the men would have wallets, right? Okay, hold your wallets up. Let me see. Everybody has got wallets? Can you give it to your next door neighbor? Please give your wallet to your neighbor. <laughs> All right. I gave it to Pastor Dennis. Come on, give me your wallet. <laughs> All right. Have you given your wallets to your neighbor? Don't give it to your spouse, please. Give it to somebody who is not your spouse. 
Did you give it to someone? Okay, so here is what we are going to do. Where is the offering box? Storehouse. Can you open that wallet and give the best offering that you have done? <laughs> Can we? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I'm just joking, okay? I'm just trying to see what it feels for you. You know, when it comes to asking your wallet and giving it off to someone else, it is like you forgot what stewardship is all about. You became an owner suddenly, right? It's as though somebody violated your ownership of your wallet. Yeah, it becomes so personal to us when it comes to the leather that we are seeing here. It becomes so personal. And we start to think that everything in that is so private to me. And you don't think of stewardship in that manner at all. You think you are the owner of what is inside here, right? But think about it. Who gave you all this? God gave you, right? If he hadn't given it to you, you wouldn't have it. But here the point is this, that many a times we forget that we are called to be stewards. First of all, he said, Jesus said, you are in the world, but you're not of this world, right? So in the forefront of your mind, you always need to have this understanding that God is the owner of everything. He has only called us to use these things which we have in our hands to be able to magnify and glorify Him. Amen? Okay, I would have even said, if you take your wallet, if you want to kiss it, you can kiss it too, you know? That's the way you feel about it, right? All right, going forward. So I'm taking my wallet back. I'm not going to give it to Pastor Dennis, but what you see here, okay? In the 21st century, this is the temple. In the century that we are living in, this is the temple. Why do I say it's a temple? Because there is a God who lives in it. His name is Mammon. Right? Mammon, the God of this world, lives inside here. Alright? The world tells us we ought to worship what is in here. Or the world is in a place where everything about your living is dictated by what is in here. Alright? Ourselves, how you feel about yourselves, our identity, our security, our well-being, our importance, and all are a direct consequence of what is inside this leather. So when it comes to Jesus, there is a lot we talk about trust and dependency on him. But when it came to that purse that left you, and when it went to your neighbor's hand, how much dependence did you have? Suddenly you saw as though somebody pulled out something out of your hand, right? How much do you depend on God when it comes to this piece of leather. Yeah? I mean, kind of testing your relationship with Jesus himself. He said, I've given you all these things. But when it comes to giving it off to someone else, you suddenly feel a kind of violated on the inside of you. Oh, no, 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 that is my purse. Right? Anyway, I mean, going forward. Now, it was not my intention to take an offering with that. That was just to help you to understand where we are going with it. Okay, now, as a steward, uh, if you think of stewardship versus ownership, there is a good game that maybe you have played while you were young, maybe you have not. Have you heard of the game of Monopoly? Yeah? Anybody played here, Monopoly? Yeah, a few of us have. So, Monopoly is all about acquisition, it's all about buying and buying more being able to strategically sell and make more money, mortgage properties, buy hotels, and finally, the one who wins becomes a master of the board. And everybody else who has lost is destroyed financially. Right? So the one who wins becomes a master of the board. He's got everything in his custody. There is a great life lesson that we need to learn out of this. By the time the game ends, what happens to the board? What happens to all the coins that you have? What happens to all the money that you have? You fold everything and put it in the box. Right? So the game has ended. Now many a times when we play this game of Monopoly, you, if you are winning, it's as though you don't never want to end this. You always want to keep having more and more and more. Right? You feel as though the game should have never ended. But even in life, it's the same. 
after you have done everything that you have to do, after you have got all that you have to get, by the way, the life comes to an end. And everything like goes back into the box, we also go back into a box. Right? So once you finish the game, you need to understand we have to fold everything up. You have to put everything into a box and somebody comes and puts the box in the, inside the ground. Right? You have become the master of the board and you really didn't want to end this life that we are talking about, which had all the resources, which had all the goodness of it, which had all the uh, riches of what we are talking about in the world. But then, the end is always the same. It goes back into a box. You have to put everything back. So when we think of it, this leather shouldn't be the one which defines us. And we need to understand this. I mean, every... Every uh, uh, church, every world organization, in every kind of uh, uh, corporation of this world, there are smart people. There are really smart people who are building up these corporations. They are building up organizations for themselves. But one of the things that they all forget, even including sometimes in the church, what we forget is this will come to an end. There is a time when all these things will come to an end and we need to go as we came, you know. Uh, this is one truth that you need to have in the forefront of your mind. That God is the one who has called us. God is the one who has planted us. God is the one who has kept us here for a plan and a purpose. So when that plan and purpose is done, we need to get back to Him. And there is going to be a time of accountability before Him. Because if you read this uh, parable, it is found in Luke chapter 12. And verse 13. Before I go there, let me see. There is another verse which I would like to bring you to. Mm. No, it's okay. Let's go here. It's, it's a parable. It's a parable of a rich young person. Uh, this is how it says, one day, one from the crowd asked Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbit arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. I mean, we saw that video and that video was about, uh, it said that it is not about bigger houses. It is not about bigger cars. It is not about bigger paychecks. It is all about running for Jesus. It is all about focusing on Him and running this race with an understanding that God has a plan and purpose. Even though He said, you are in the world, but you are not of this world. So if you are in the world and not of this the world, then what is the real reason why you are here? God has called you to be ambassadors for Christ. Amen? So what is an ambassador for Christ? What do you mean by an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who has come from another foreign place into the land that he is living. Now what is his primary uh, goal? That he should be able to talk about the country that he has come from. Where he is representing some other country. Right? If you think of it, uh, the ambassador of India who is in UAE, who should he be talking about? About India, right? Where he has been delegated and sent. The same manner, God has called us to be ambassadors of Christ to live on this earth. So who should we be talking about? Who should we be talking about? What is our primary aim? To be able to impact this world for Christ. Amen? Now, uh, I need to ask Rebecca, can I talk about this incident? Yeah, uh, I did the same uh, in Dubai, so I just need to ask her permission again. Uh, you know, the other day, one of her friends came to stay with her. Her exam was over and she was rejoicing over, oh, the exam is over. Now it's holidays, lots of time in front of me to make this, uh, you know, fun and games now. It's time for me to relax. And her friend came. And uh, they decided to go to Dera city center. Now, 
Rebecca being Rebecca as she travels every day on the metro, she went with her. She, they took the metro ticket and went. And as they were going, uh, they forgot that they were in the metro. And they were laughing and talking and rejoicing over the holiday that they have. And, uh, and as a normal young person, her friend started to Mm, 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 mm. What do I mean? Started to chew in the metro. Now it's written in bold letters no eating, no drinking. Alright? So somebody comes and picks both up and says, You have violated the law of the metro. Now, Rebecca had some gifts that was given by people on her birthday. This time she got a lot more money than gifts. Now she had to shell out from there 110 dirham as fine. Can you think of it? She has got into this metro going to rejoice and look at what happened. She is traveling by metro on a daily basis and how come she didn't, she didn't think of this and tell her friend what is the law. So both of them had to pay this money. Now this is what happens. If we are an ambassador for something and we are not doing what God has called us to do. Amen. Why I'm saying that is because even if you think of this time that is coming in front of us, which is called Ramadan. What happens if you eat on the road? No, they will catch you, put you in the jail and give you biryani in the evening and send you back. <laughs> right? Anybody here for the first time? This is your first Ramadan. Anybody here? I I'm want to I want to be an ambassador for UAE for the time being. Yeah, I mean this is what happens. Everybody is here who has been here through Ramadan. So I don't have to be an ambassador for UAE. I'd rather be the ambassador for Christ. All right. So what I'm trying to say is many a times though we understand that God has called us with a purpose. We forget being in the world who we are and whose we are. Amen. And we forget to be that ambassador of Christ. That he's called us to be. And we just be like the world. There is no difference. Once you get out of this church. I don't even know whether you say hallelujah or praise the Lord. Once you go out of the church. When is the next time you would say hallelujah or praise the Lord? When you are back in church. Right? So until then what are you doing? You have become the ambassador of the world. Rather than for Christ. Amen. So the thing is, we need to come to a place where we start to understand that this is very important for us to portray who we are in this world. So this man comes to Jesus and tells him, tell my brother to divide this inheritance with me. And then Jesus says, take heed, beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. So if you think of it, Jesus recognizes that this man's question it's because he's more worried about the money than worried about his brother. He's more worried about what about this money that belongs to me rather than the brother's soul. Amen. So Jesus recognizes this and tells him a parable. And he spoke this parable. Uh, you know, I mean, I suddenly remembered yesterday while we were in this house. Uh, I saw this picture that Delina had taken in her iPod. Uh, and she, she was showing this and uh, I saw this man, uh, there was a apartment which caught fire in Abu Dhabi. It was just opposite where Pastor Dennis lives. And this man uh, caught inside this fire ablaze of this apartment was trying to escape. Now he came out and he held on to something which was a very fickle thing. And that thing gave way and she, he fell straight on the ground. And his life was over. That's all life is. I mean, it's, it's like a vapor. He didn't plan when he got up in the morning that he's going to uh, give up his life. It is not that he had any plans about it. But everything that transpired during the day came to a place where he is now no more. Now, when I see that photograph, I was thinking, this is how he came into the world. He came into the world with nothing. And now it is time for him to go and there is nothing that he can take. It is not his wife, it is not his child, it is not his property, it is not his car. There is nothing that you can take. 
It is just that he is lying there on the ground. And his life is gone. And this is the same for all of us. We need to ask ourselves, what is the prime motive for us to live in this world? Is it that we have this understanding that God has called us to be ambassadors for Christ? Is it that we have his word hidden on the inside of us? Is it that he has called us to be the light and the salt of this earth and we are really doing what God has called us to do? Or is it that we are running after things that does not even matter in the kingdom of God? Amen? So he spoke a parable to uh, help us understand how it is when it comes to kingdom living. And this is found in Luke chapter 12. Uh, reading from 16 to 21. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, What shall I do? This is about a man who was living in this world. Okay, And Jesus is talking about the story of this man as how he wanted more and more and more. He's just like any of us. And he is saying about what how does the kingdom of God perceive such a person? Okay, this is what he said. And he thought with, within himself saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ma many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Amen? So this is how the kingdom of God sees someone who is building and making all these things in this world, but not even thinking about what happens to his life after he finishes this race. God is calling him a fool. So this evening, while we are sitting here, what do you make of your own life? Are we rich towards God? Or are we doing things that are in this world like the world does? Now I want to put this in a, a 21st century context. I'm going to tell you a story. You're alright with the story? Normally it's only Pastor Dennis who tells the story. I'm taking the privilege tonight to say a story, okay? Or tell a story, narrate a story. This is a story of a man just like us. All he ever wanted was more. Better cars, bigger houses, bigger paycheck, more of the bank balance. Anybody identifies with all this? Hey, it's just like us, right? Okay, going forward. And he was running to do whatever it takes to get more. Mind you, this is absolutely right in the eyes of the world. There is nothing wrong if you are doing this in the world. The world will applaud you for what you do. Okay? So, even in the world education system, this is what they teach. That you should make more and more and more. How do you make more? That's what they teach. Alright? And it's termed as getting to be successful. So, in the world, this is called as being successful. And it took about everything for him that he would work 12 to 14 hours a day. He would join the board of directors, professional organizations, network with people. So his work wasn't his occupation anymore. It became a preoccupation. Amen? What it means is even while he is relaxing, his work thoughts will take over him. Work became a preoccupation for him. His wife would sometimes nag him about how the kids were growing up and how he was missing it. Every day he would come back home and he would have his briefcase with him. And his son finally kind of, kind of asked him, he got troubled with this and he asked him, Dad, how come you always bring your briefcase home? And he would say, son, it's because I can't get all my work done at the office. One morning by 1 a.m. he is in bed. And he gets a pain in the chest. And the next day his wife makes an appointment at the doctors. And the doctors tell him that he got to change some real serious habits. And he's got all the classic symptoms of elevated blood pressure, elevated cholesterol. And every other thing that you can name it. And he says to himself, 
yeah, I will deal with it in another six months or so when the things settle down at my company. He has a church nearby. It's not that he's far away from the church. And he believes in God. He believes that God is real. But he really didn't have time for that kind of things. He said, I can believe in God and without having to go to church, I can still be a godly man. One day, the COO, the chief operating uh, officer of his company came to him and said, you're not going to believe this, but we are in the brink of an economic miracle, not a meltdown, economic miracle. This is good news. And this is what we have been waiting for. And if we catch this wave, we'll be set for life. But the orders are coming in so fast that we can't keep up with the demands. And our softwares are so hopelessly outdated. And if we don't reorganize things, we'll be in serious trouble. From that moment on, this man is in the story is like a possessed person. Every morning he wakes up, he is devoted to this once in a lifetime opportunity and it hits him that he can put his company through a technological revolution and reorganize everything and restructure everything and go wireless and dot com and everything and he goes home that night and he says to his wife you know what it means don't you and he goes uh, and, and, and as he talks to his wife by the time I finish this project, I'll be able to relax because I've covered every base. I've covered every contingency. This will be it. This will be success. This is what I've been waiting for all my life. So he paints this picture before his wife. Now his wife has heard this kind of a talk for a long time. So she doesn't give much thought to it and neither gets her hope up. By 11 o'clock, she goes to bed and asks him, do you want to come with me? And the guy says, no. I want to get a little more work done. And he sits in front of his computer. Couple of more emails to catch up. A little more Facebook to fish through. And he said, you go to bed, honey. I'll be right there. And she goes to bed. And by about 3 o'clock in the morning, she wakes up. And he's still not there. She goes downstairs and she finds him asleep at the table. She touches him at his shoulder to wake him up and to his, her horror, she finds him dead. So by the time the doctors came in and they checked, they tell her that he had a massive heart attack and had been dead for hours. His death is a famous story in the financial community and his obituary is written in Forbes, World, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal, Times of Abu Dhabi, etc. Uh, the obituary is flashed all over there. Then they have a memorial service and because of his prominence, everybody in the whole community comes to the service. They all come past this casket and they all have the same stupid thing that, they, that people say at funerals. And I'm sure you have heard it too. He looks very peaceful. But that's what happens when you're dead. Right? Everybody says this. Oh, he looks very peaceful. And now people get up to say great things about him. This admired, respected, accusative statesman, hmm, if I may add, family neglecting, God ignoring man. For the world, he was a leader. Somebody gets up to say he was an innovator, creative genius. He knows everybody in the community. He was a networker. Because of such stature in life, the world put a marble pillar for his tombstone with all fabulous words. And at the very top of it, the word, the golden word, the word that people in this land Church going people would sell their souls for. What's that word? Successful. Successful men. And they all went home. Okay. And when it was night, dark, and no one was around, the angel of God came. 
to the cemetery and wrote on that admired, well-respected man's tombstone one word that summarized that man's life in the eyes of God. Anyone knows what that word is? It just said fool. There was only one word that God had to say about that kind of a living. God just said, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Nothing is really yours. There is a time coming when we'll also be folded up and put in a box. And then we will need to give account for all that we did in this body when we are on this earth. Amen. And on that day, like it said in many places in the word of God, if you go with me to Romans 14 and 12, it clearly writes, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That day you will not have Pastor Samson by your side. You will not have Pastor Dennis by your side. You will not have Pastor Arun by your side. Not even your wife. Not even your children. We're just going to stand right in front of God and give account of all that we have done. I'm telling you, this is a challenging message, but it's the reality of the kingdom of God. Amen? So as Romans 14 and 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I want you to understand this. I'm going to take you through two passages of the word of God, which clearly tells us as to what kingdom of God living is. Jesus talks about two parables and I want to take that parable in comparison one with the other. But I want you to turn there with me. It's in Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 14. And this is how Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two and to another one. Then it's written there, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. And then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So when he had, when he had the five talents, the guy came, came in front of him and he brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more and so on. Okay. Now, the, the important thing of this, this parable is it's written there that God gave each according to his ability. So this is talking about, the parable is talking about God calling each one of us and separating you or giving you a call on your life. Now think of it, the fivefold ministry of the church. Some are called to be pastors. Some are called to be teachers. Some are called to be evangelists. Some are called to be uh, prophets, apostles, administrators. Now some are not called any of these. Like say for instance, there are people who are in the world were called to be great doctors, who are a blessing to the community. Or think of uh, Rebecca was telling me about this young person in the Dubai church. His name is Leo. Now Leo is, I mean, it seems like he has made some app. The, the app you see on the iPad and uh, those gadgets today, the smartphones. He was able to make an app which is to help people who are blind. Who can't see, right? Is that what it is? Oh, he, he came up with a concept of how to make the iPhone work for someone who is not able to see. And he is trying to make that app. So think of it from his point of view. God has put talents on the inside of him to do something for the community, which he's not, it's not that he wants it for himself. He's trying to do that for somebody else, to help someone else who is at a disadvantage. Think of uh, Pastor Manuel's daughter, Chrissy. Now she is in a place where she is making her own album. God has put a talent on the inside of her 
and she is using that to bring out glory and honor to God. Amen. So think of it from that perspective. What has God put on the inside of you? God has called you for something. God has not left any of us without a talent. Amen. Now in comparison with this parable, I want you to go with me to another one which looks almost similar. You might even think that Matthew and Luke are talking about the same parable, but it is not the same parable. Okay, go with me to um, Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from uh, verse 12. And here it says, this is now Jesus narrating this parable. Okay, so you need to understand it is no, not anybody else, but it's Jesus. So if Jesus says something, is it important for you? Amen. So this is what he said. A certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself the kingdom and to return. So he called his ten of his servants and delivered to them ten minas. Or let's let's put it in our context. Ten dirhams. Okay? No, that, that wouldn't be fair. I mean, let, let's put it as one village. Okay? What is the smallest currency that we have? One pill, right? I mean, we don't have that as a currency, but uh, that's the smallest unit. Now, he calls 10 of his servants and gives them 10 fills. What does that mean? How much did each one get? One fill. Can we make it a little better? Maybe a durum? Yeah? Let's make it a one durum. So, God is talking about, he calling 10 of his servants and giving them 10 dirhams. So how many did each one of them get? One dirham each. Right? So was there any difference between the dirhams? It's the same dirham. Same one dirham. Right? Now, then he said to them, Do business till I come. Now here is 10 people that he called. And each of them he gave the same amount of money. No difference. There's absolutely no difference between what the first one got and the last one got. Every one of them got the same one dirham. Okay? Do business till I come. Uh, verse 15. So he, it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to come and uh, to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much each man has gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned me 10 minas or your dhuram has earned me 10 dhurams. How many dhurams did he have? How much did he make? What did he do with it? To make it 10. He went and traded. He was faithful with the one that he had. The word of God says, if you are faithful in little, it will make you rule over much. So ask yourself as to what God has given you. Are you faithful in that little that God has given you? This man, having one dirham, he made it and multiplied it to become ten. He called another one. Another one had multiplied it to five. Then there was one who came to him and said, I know that you are a hard man. I know that you are an austere man. So what I did with the money is, I went and hid it in the ground. And now here is your money. What happens to that man? Jesus says that that man was asked to be thrown into the lake of fire. Into the place where there is gnashing of teeth. Are you with me? So this evening, if you think of this parable and how things are in the kingdom of God. And if you are not of this kingdom, but of that kingdom. How should you be living your life? It should be in the same manner as it was with the first two people. They both got one dirham each but they were able to multiply it and was faithful in that little that they got amen now when you think of this parable this parable actually puts all of us in the same level why do i say that because if you think of it anyone has a bible in your hand okay can i see your bible is that the same bible everybody else has here no it has to be, right? It's the same word of God. 
It's the same word of God that everybody has when you say this is my Bible. At least the contents of it. Right? This is the same Jesus that we all believe in. There is no difference. Is it the same message that we are all hearing? But I'm sure somebody will go and apply this tomorrow and do something with the word that they heard. Every week we come together and hear messages. And the word of God says, and the preacher here stands there and says, not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And some of them will go and do it. Some of them will go and relax over it. Some of them will let the devil steal the word from them. Right? So are we being faithful in that one that equates all of us? It's the same Jesus. It's the same Bible. It's the same Holy Spirit. Anybody else has a different Holy Spirit here? You can have a different spirit though. Yeah? But it's the same Holy Spirit. Now, if you think of it, how many hours do we have in a day? Is there anybody who has 36 hours? Sister Dorothy, you have 36 hours? You're only 24, right? What about Stefan? You have anything less or more? God has put us all in the same place with having that 24 hours. He has put us in the same place having the same Holy Spirit. God has put Paul also on this earth with the same Holy Spirit, with the same Jesus, with the same Holy Spirit, with the same 24 hours. And he was able to come to that end of his life and say, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, I've finished the course. So what about each one of us? There is going to be a time when we'll stand before him and give him account for every resource that he gave us. The money that we have in our hand, the family that God has given us. And let me put it in perspective. How many of us has got the good news of the gospel on the inside of us? How many of us have experienced salvation? What are you doing with that salvation that you have? Are you a good steward of that salvation if you didn't go and share it with someone else? Think of it for a moment. How many souls do we bring into the kingdom of God? What is our mission, first of all, if you think of it from God's perspective, so that we'll touch another life. Amen? So that we will be able to impact another for the kingdom of God. So how many of us can really say that we've been good stewards of the light that God has put on the inside of you? How many of us can say that we've been the good salt that God has called me to be? The salt of this world, the light of this earth. Amen? This evening, God is really looking at us and asking us, how can we be counted like Paul was to be a faithful servant for Christ? And I'm telling you this, it's never too late to make a decision. We are still in our body. We are still alive. We are still following Jesus. And there is still time ahead of us, but a short time before his coming. But we need to ask ourselves, have I been an ambassador for Christ the way he has called me to be? Like we said in this parable, this is all in the same equal ground. There is no difference. We all have the equal opportunity. We all have the 24 hours of the day. We all have the same gospel on the inside of us. If you think of it, even the measure of faith that was dealt in us, it's the same. But it depends on you what you do with that faith to grow that faith. Amen. That day when you got saved, God dealt on the inside of you a measure of faith. But some of us here have been diligent with it. And what did you do to grow your faith? The word of God says, by hearing and hearing the word of God, you're able to mature that faith. Amen. So some people, after going back from church, they would have the uh, tapes running, they would have the books being read, they would have all these things being done so that the faith will grow. Amen? So it's just like those people who had one dhurum, but what did they do? They multiplied it. So what are you doing with that one measure of faith that was dealt on the inside of us, each one of us? Are we multiplying it? 
are we getting to a place where we are receiving this word with a challenge on the inside of us? I want to live the life out in such a way that it impacted this world for Christ. Amen? Is that your resolve this evening? Like we said, or like we sang, we sang this in the beginning. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. This evening as you sing that song, are you in a place where you want to look forward or do you want to go back? Back into the world, the way you were living. Or is it that you have a resolve this evening? That you want to live in such a way that you're going to be a positive impact in this kingdom, in this world, for the kingdom of God. Amen? If that is you, I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up onto your feet. And we'll sing the song once again. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The wall behind me, the cross before me. The wall behind me, the cross before me. The wall behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. No turning back, no turning back. Lord, even this evening, Father God, that we come at our lives once again in your hands. But each one of us, this is our heart's desire. That we will be able to live out this life in such a way that the opportunities that you have given us, the resources that you have given us, the families that you have given us, the children that you have given us, that everything belongs to you. There is nothing that we can say that we own because you have called us to be stewards of everything that we have. That even the jobs that we have, the houses that we have, we live in, that are all that you have given us. And this evening, this is our prayer, Lord, that we will have it in the forefront of our mind, that we are ambassadors for Christ, living in this earth, to be able to impact another life for your kingdom. And even this evening, as we continue to sing this song, Father God, that I pray, Lord, that this will be a song of dedication, giving ourselves into your hands to do as you please with us, Father God. As Paul said, what do you want of me, Lord? And this evening, Lord, I pray, Father God, this is our heart's cry, that you help us to come to that place where we are available and willing in your hands to do what you have called us to do. Thank you, Lord. As we sing the song, I want you to sing the song softly. Shepherd of my soul, I give you full control. Wherever you may lead, I will follow. I have made the choice. To listen for your voice, wherever you may lead, I will go. Be it in the quiet pasture, or by a gentle stream, the shepherd of my soul is by my side. Should I face a mighty mountain or a valley dark and deep, 
the shepherd of my soul will be my guide. Shepherd of my soul, I give you full control. Wherever you may lead, I will follow. I have made a choice to listen to your voice. Wherever you may lead, I will go. Lord, even this evening, once again, thank you, Father God, for this time, this privilege, this evening that you gave us, Lord, to ponder on your word. And we thank you, Father God, for we start to understand that the kingdom living is way different from how we live in this world, Father God. And I pray, Father God, from this day onward, my brothers, my sisters, myself, Lord, I pray, Father God, that we will, we will wrap ourselves around, Father God, our spirit man will wrap ourselves around the kingdom of God living, Father God. And I pray, Lord, that from this moment on, as we walk into this world, that is, someone will be able to look at us and say, he's an ambassador for Christ. She's an ambassador for Christ. And Lord, I pray, Father God, in the forefront of our mind, it will be so etched in our hearts, Father God, in the forefront of our minds, Lord, that we have been called to be ambassadors for Christ. And that as we live this life, Lord, I pray, Father God, that we will multiply every opportunity, everything that you have given us, Father God, for your glory. That if we give you glory, honor, and praise even this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you blessed this evening? Amen. Now, what we need to do is we need to not only be hearers of the word, but so what do we do from tomorrow onwards? We live out the ambassador of Christ living in this world. Amen. Are you all for it? Amen. What's the pastor done? Amen. Mm -hmm.